a couple of years back, we did a video on uh, replacing diff and transfer box oils, and uh, this was on the fine art of uh, Land Rover maintenance. In this, I elaborated on what Land Rover specified for oil changes, and I talked about the uh, sea service. There's also a bit in there which you can watch the video if you want to about when the oils should be changed if you're working in an extreme environment. Now, I've uh, got uh, something from uh, a question from somebody, a comment about a month ago, um, that seems to think that uh, they don't quite understand what's going on. So it's Joppy 208, or 2008, should I say, um, thinks that Italy is hot and dusty, so they should change their oil every month. Um, I have replied to it, and I said basically, um, you know, comparing to what uh, quarry trucks do, um, they up it to an EP130 instead of an 8090 EP. Um, come back with a different name. Obviously, it's the same person, Anna Pope, so I don't know if it's a man or a woman, um, saying that uh, my disco is not a truck and I'm not working in a quarry, ex exclamation mark. Okay, fair enough. Because I live in Italy, where there is more dust, you are saying that I should change oils every month and I don't think Anna has actually grasped the concept of uh, what uh, an extreme environment is so I've uh, basically said just go and get a mechanic to um, arrange servicing for your vehicle instead of uh, looking on YouTube because um, if with experience you know what oils um, suffer in extreme conditions now this one for instance has come out of an axle is emulsified which means it's got water in it so uh, I'm, I'm afraid I, I'm not going to answer uh, people if they persistently uh, show ignorance because I know they're looking for stuff on YouTube. If they've got a grasp of it, I can explain. If not, then I'm sorry. If I, I can't devote all my time to uh, helping people out that are not really interested other than uh, what she, he or she has done here has actually complained uh, about how bad the discovery is. So in the politest terms, I'm just saying, please, just go and... Um, talk to somebody in your local area and uh, then you can uh, work out from there rather than relying on people that are thousands of miles away. Okay, um, let's get back to reality, the TD5. Uh, there's a couple of relays here which are the ECU relays. You'll see this one and that one. This is to immobilize the engine so it won't start when I crank it over. What I have here is an amp clamp, okay? It's a low amperage clamp which uh, you can measure amperage with. But I'm using uh, this in conjunction with a, a, a graphing voltmeter, two volts and a uh, time scale of one second. Uh, what I'm looking for here, I'll crank it over and you can see the starter motor is giving us a signal. Every time it has resistance uh, pushing the uh, uh, piston up it will give us uh, a reading so we can actually see if there is less resistance on a cylinder compared with others I mean this is only a rough test even with any diesel compression test you are only going to look for um, differences it's okay no problem anyway TDI runs and she's okay and I'll let you have a listen before um, she's stripped out of the uh, the vehicle Okay, well, I hope that you enjoyed that little symphony there. So, anyway, uh, this is a good piece of equipment. I wouldn't advise buying one unless you're going to uh, make your money out of this. I use this at work all the time. It's just handy at home as well. But I'll show you the way things are. Um, this is really the way to go. Oscilloscopes are brilliant. Right, so at home, TD5 front axle stripped out. And I'm going to be welding this at some point. Um, the diff here which uh, appears to be in good condition. I use the word appears to be in good condition because I don't know yet. Um, you can see, I'll just tell you, this is called an open diff. Right, one side of the uh, steering was okay and the other side is a uh, C solid, so that's gonna need some ball joints without a doubt. So we're gonna have to do them. Okay, I don't wanna talk about the axle per se. I wanna talk about how we as uh, mechanics look at things. We look at separate components and how they're put together and what is inside. This is a lot of time, this is just general knowledge, okay? We know there are half shafts in there, they need to come out before we can get the diff out, and you also need to drain the oil, otherwise you uh, get a mess. Now, I want to talk about using your brain and the same sort of techniques and looking at how things are put together because we're gonna do a fair bit of fabrication 
got the engine stand here and we can see that it is just pieces of metal put together in a certain order. So uh, we can have a look at the arm for instance. Um, it's got an angle cut here, two box sections welded together, a bolt and this is a channel section or a, a bent flat bar. Okay, that's welded uh, as well. Okay, now this uh, box section has also the a slider in it or the, the arm extension which to be honest with you is a really sloppy tolerance. That's probably all that's needed for this. On the end of it, you have a uh, hole drilled in it, bolt through, uh, a bent uh, bar, and uh, a cast clamp on there. So, I mean, you can split this down and see how things are made. This angle here, obviously, <coughs> um, what we can do is measure the angle. And obviously, it's not going to be half a degree of something or another, but... Um, basically, yeah, we can work out how things are made, what angles are cut, and it's not rocket science. We have a, a tube here with a flat bar welded to it, holes drilled in it, and it's probably riv-nutted into the uh, shaft there, and this is actually loose as well, okay? Bicycle handle grips, no problem. We can make one of those if we want to. Uh, this will have an angle cut onto it, a uh, C-channel section welded there, a bracket um, welded to the upright with a uh, hole in it. Um, the ram is bolted to it. Okay, easy. Uh, flat bar there, um, welded. Uh, you, you get the idea, don't you? Um, the bottom plate here is bent in a in a stop brake press, and uh, basically you, you get the you get to see. You use your brain to see what pieces are what and how they're welded together. It's it's not rocket science. Some of you guys already know this. Now, you could look at this and think, ah, it's an I-beam, but it's not. You've got two channel sections welded either end, some flat bar and a gusset plate for strength, and you can see how this is welded. So what we can do as uh, novices, we can actually copy this stuff. And it's just general engineering practices. I mean, proportions obviously make a difference for strength. You see there again, there's a bit of a channel or a bit of flat bar that's been bent round. This one is basic as well. You've got two tubes there, one inside another. That's welded to a flat plate. And the, the, the bit of engineering there is the slots that have been cut into it. But you've also just got box section and some more tubing. Not rocket science again. Looking a bit further down, okay, you've got your upright, which is welded to a bit of channel, uh, gusset plate, and uh, two bits of box section. All right, on the bottom here, how you fit the wheel on is basically just a bit of flat plate. So getting to some chassis work, we have uh, the 300 TDI engine mounts. And uh, now you can see you have uh, a piece cut. It's probably CNC cut, actually. Um, both sides, a certain shape, angle. You have a flat plate, which you can see the bend marks in it. So this has been bent in a brake press. And it's been MIG welded, and you can tell it's MIG welded by the way um, it's been welded. Okay, it's probably a Friday afternoon rush to get it out, I don't know. Uh, but basically, if you can see them, you can measure them, you can make them, yeah? Easy, huh? Uh, these ones are actually for sale at some point. Uh, you can see the uh, brake press marks in there where it's been bent over. It's probably one long section and then cut into pieces and then made up. This is from uh, Richard's Chassis that sent me this. Now, this is what this is leading to, and I need some axle stands. I know I've got loads of them, but they're not the right ones, believe it or not. Um, now, this is the one hands give me. It's uh, that's a quite a good one. These little ones, this uh, they're cheapies, sealies. Now, you can see that these are two sections are welded together to make the main body. You can see the weld up in there. You also have the uh, top section here, which is a piece cut out, folded round, and then welded on the top. Yeah, you can see the weld there very clearly. Um, you have a mechanism here that's been fitted, which is um, your tooth um, lock. Okay, and then you have the top piece here, which is one piece cast. You can see that, so it's, uh, yeah, you can also see there's a lot of spatter on most of these uh, sealy parts very much rushed now this is an old axle stand this is just a piece of flat bar bent you can see that and it's welded to a tube you can see the weld there the tube has been drilled um, what we have is a larger tube okay no big deal some angle iron and some flat bar yeah uh, welded in the right places 
The angle iron has been shaped, so this would have been done en masse in a machine, shaped, put together, welded very quickly, okay? So mass produced, and then a collar on the top there, which is just a washer. The big stuff, now I found this in a skip, believe it or not, at work, and uh, um, something's on fire there. <laughs> Actually, no, I've not given up smoking yet, but it's coming. Right, so basically what we have is tube, flat bar, flat bar, flat bar, yeah? You get where I'm coming from, don't you? Okay, this one, axle stand, uh, angle bracket, uh, or angle line, um, cut so it fits on the, uh, the tube. And then, of course, what we have is the uh, tube that runs inside, holes drilled in it till we get to the top, which is a piece of a channel section welded on there. Okay, um, this one here is made very much the same way. I don't really need to explain it. It's uh, got the flat bar welded in a different place, maybe for stabilizing it. Okay, so yeah, we can cheat here, we can measure all of this um, the external and uh, thickness of the wall and work out what tubing we need, measure the length, and uh, okay, we can then order something like that. Flat bar, yeah, I mean, that's standard stock stuff. You can buy that um, from any uh, metal suppliers, any engineers, and so with the tube as well. The one thing here, obviously, um, I would like to change the design of this because this gets damaged after a while. It's only a small length of tubing, but what I'll do is I'll find a collar to fit like this, uh, for when the pin sits on it, it won't get damaged. So the, the important measurements obviously would be here, would be the internal diameter of uh, the body of the uh, uh, axle stand. And uh, I don't think, I don't know if you can see that, that's plus 10 mil. And then the external diameter of the uh, inner pole. I mean, these, these axle stands are rated at six tons. Obviously they can take a little bit more, however, Having bigger, taller axle stands is uh, brilliant. Now, anyway, the the angle on the on this, I couldn't get the gauging close enough, so I used a pair of dividers. And the idea is measure at the bottom and the top, get the 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 distance equal, and then I can work out the angle from there. And it, yeah, obviously this isn't rocket science to do. This is just a welding project, and uh, I need, like I say, I need four of these to support the vehicle possibly six when I'm doing some welding, and I might just do one that has an adjustment on it. Uh, let's wait and see.